Hey everybody, welcome to another multi-game My Thoughts On video where I talk about my thoughts on five different games that I don't really have all that much to say about individually, so I just bundle them all together into this one video. Time codes for each individual game will be in the description box, so if you want to skip to one in particular, then you can certainly do that. But otherwise, let's go ahead and get started. The first game we'll be taking a look at here is Ziggurat. This is by Milkstone Studios and was released in 2014, and it's a roguelite first-person shooter dungeon crawler where you play as a novice mage who is basically trying to earn their stripes. To that end, you venture into the Ziggurat and you fight your way through randomly generated levels in roguelite fashion where you gradually upgrade over time and eventually you end up either dying or managing to move on to the next level. Graphically, it's not particularly impressive. I mean, it doesn't have particularly high-res models, the textures aren't particularly high-res either, the animations are very simplistic, and all that sort of thing. But it does feature a somewhat cartoonish art style that is very reminiscent of something like World of Warcraft. The problem with that is that that aesthetic is rather overused at this point, which means that this looks rather tiresome. But beyond that, they still have done a pretty decent job with presentation overall. I mean, spells definitely sound like you're splinging spells around, so that's nice. Monsters are relatively easy to identify based on the noise they make, and of course you have the various environmental sounds and the music, which are definitely fitting, albeit not particularly impressive. But it's an indie game, and the presentation isn't the most important aspect of this title anyway. What really matters is the gameplay, because there's pretty much no story in this whatsoever, other than occasional notes you pick up that say, Hey, this is a thing for mages that you're doing for reasons. In other words, it doesn't do much of anything to help you out as far as lore or any sort of plot goes. So you end up focusing entirely on the gameplay, and to that end you have your health meter, you have your mana meters, and you have four different weapon slots. The first slot is occupied by your magic wand, which has infinite ammo and slowly recharges over time, but it is the weakest weapon in the game. Your second slot is occupied by spells. These are the blue mana items that are basically just books that you pick up and you cast spells out of them. The third slot is the green mana and that is for staves. And then the last slot is the orange mana and that is for alchemical weapons like grenade launchers and such. When you enter a level, you're going to get access to a single weapon and as you continue progressing through the dungeon, you're going to get access to more and more of them throughout the course of the game and you might even run into multiple weapons of the same type, so you might want to switch out your currently equipped spell for a new spell that you find later on in the dungeon or something along those lines as you see fit. You also pick up knowledge orbs which eventually will allow you to level up and pick a perk and that gives you some sort of static bonus whether it be something like increasing the size of your mana pools or being something like giving you the ability to regenerate your health a bit better or something along those lines. Eventually you'll also be able to unlock additional characters which have different stats, so they do actually play a bit differently than the starting characters. And of course this being a roguelite kind of deal, when you die you have to start all over again. There's no loading a previous save there, the only save you get is a single file that only exists as long as your character lives. Now the thing is, most roguelite style games tend to have this grinding system in place where you go on a dungeon run, you end up dying, but whatever you did in the dungeon manages to count towards your next playthrough, and eventually you get to the point where you can finally get through the dungeon. Ziggurat doesn't really do that. Instead, it relies more on your ability to maneuver in the actual levels and your ability to actually aim at things. Of course, it does still have the problems of all of the levels being randomly generated and all of the item drops being randomly generated, which means that you can get stuck with a relatively crappy weapon and you're just stuck with it for however long it takes to replace it. And no amount of claims that the game is based entirely on player's skill can escape the fact that eventually the enemies just become total damage sponges and your weapons really don't get much more powerful as you get through the game. It eventually just becomes a tedious slog to get through the levels, and you will find that the layouts of those levels get repeated over and over and over again, meaning that the entire production comes across as kind of lazily slapped together. Granted, that's what random generation of levels does. It always makes them come across as lazy and haphazardly slapped together, and you can't really escape that without some really, really careful algorithms. And even with those careful algorithms, you'll still notice that the levels feel very samey. Ziggurat doesn't have a sort of careful level generation algorithm, it's just a 
pretty average one. And as a result, the levels are simply a resounding meh. You do have a boss fight at the end of every single level of the dungeon, but here's the thing. I found the boss fights were actually easier than the minion fights, because the minions get thrown at you in droves and tend to surround you and you're just kind of stuck. Whereas with the boss fight, all you do is just circle strafe them and hit them with whatever spells you've got, and they go down very easily. And I noticed that the enemy types just kept repeating over and over and over again as I kept continuing through the dungeons, so it just eventually got to the point where it felt like a total tedious slog, and I just stopped playing it. If you're a fan of roguelites or roguelike style games, then you'll probably be able to enjoy this, but other than that, I really can't recommend it unless you get it at a very steep discount, and even then, it's gonna wear thin pretty quickly. Well, let's go ahead and move on to Vertiginous Golf. This is a mini-golf game developed by Kanelco and Lone Elk Creative and published by Surprise Attack in 2014, and I really have barely anything to say about this. It's a mini-golf game, and it's steampunk-themed. Mechanically, it's pretty much your average mini-golf game, except that they introduce a mechanic where you can take control of a bird and use that as a camera to scout out the level ahead, and you also get access to the ability to rewind your shots if you don't like the way they went. Beyond that, you're dealing with a relatively average, mechanically speaking anyway, mini-golf game that is really only interesting because of its theme, and the theme allows them to mess around with the levels quite a bit and create something that's actually pretty interesting. For example, there's actually a fair bit of verticality in this, whereas in other mini-golf games there simply wouldn't be. But beyond that, it's a pretty basic mini-golf game. You whack a golf ball with a putter and you try to get it into the cup in as few strokes as possible. Aesthetics and quirky level design notwithstanding, this is something that's been done before many times. And unless you really like the aesthetics or you really like mini golf games in general, then you're probably just not going to be able to get all that much out of it. I mean, the only reason I actually have this game is because it came in one of the bundles that I got a while back, and when I got around to trying it, I'm like, I can see why this was in a bundle and I didn't actually get this on its own. It's not an outright bad game or anything, it's just that there's really not a huge amount on offer here, and it's the kind of thing where I can't recommend getting it on its own. Now if it's included in a bundle that you're getting and you wanted to get the bundle for a bunch of other games and this is just kind of a bonus, then that's one thing. But if you're looking into getting this on its own, I would say don't bother with it. Next we're going to talk about a series of games by RuneStorm called Viscera Cleanup Detail. There's various versions available of these, and the one you're seeing in this video is the Shadow Warrior version. The basic idea behind all of these is that you're the janitor who goes in after the rampages to clean up the mess. So in the case of the Shadow Warrior version, after Lo Wang just slices and dices the Yakuza to bits, well, it's your job to go in there and clean up the mess. They all run in the Unreal Engine, and they have decent enough visuals, although in the case of the Shadow Warrior version, I do have to say they pretty much nailed the aesthetic, so good job for that. But there's really not much to say in terms of presentation. Apart from the environmental visuals generally being pretty solid, they don't really have a lot going on, because it's just a bunch of giblets all over the place that you're trying to clean up, and pretty much everything is a physics-based animation. Meaning that it's fairly simplistic and often kind of crude. Beyond that, you have sound design that is alright, I mean, you have the squishy noises of giblets being moved around, you have the commentary of the janitor himself, and of course you have whatever environmental sounds are going on, whether it's running water or music playing in the background or whatever that might be. So there's really not much there in terms of presentation, so what you're going to be focused on instead is the actual gameplay, because there's really no story to this other than you are the janitor who goes in to clean up the mess after the battle's over. To that end, you have a few tools that you can use to assist you in the job, which the most commonly used tool is going to be the mop and bucket. Because that's how you mop up all of the blood stains, and of course you can pick up the giblets and put them in disposal bins, and you pick up the rest of the mess and put those in other bins as well. And that's kind of it, actually. I mean, in the Shadow Warrior version, you can pick up some extra cash that's scattered around the level to eventually get an achievement, but other than that, there's really not much to this game at all. All of the draw for these games is in the joke itself, which is admittedly amusing for the first few minutes, and then the tedium sets in, and it just ends up being a really boring game. 
Now, in the case of the Shadow Warrior version, it is included with any purchase of the Shadow Warrior reboot, so it's not like you're going to be paying a lot for it. And at least the Santa's Rampage version is $2.50, so for a gag gift or something, it's not exactly overwhelming. The original game, however, is $13 plus $2.99 for the additional DLC, and that's just a bit unacceptable, honestly. For a game that is entirely about the mere joke of being the janitor who cleans up the mess after the battle is over and all you're doing is really tedious, menial work, well, it's just not very enjoyable, and if you are paying quite a bit for it, like $13, which could be spent on any number of other things, well, let's just say that it wears out its welcome very quickly, and no amount of co-op can help with that either. So ultimately, the only time I could recommend even trying out Viscera Cleanup Detail is if, for example, you get Shadow Warrior and it's included and you just want to mess around with it for a few minutes as a joke. Otherwise, don't bother. The next game I have barely anything to say about at all. It's called Neon Drive, and it was developed by, I believe you pronounce it as Fraula, but I'm not 100% sure on that. And it's basically like audio surf, but more 80s retro inspired. Aesthetically, it looks absolutely fantastic. You've got all those neon lights going on, everything is bright and colorful, it looks like something straight out of the 80s, except with more modern graphics, obviously. It even has the light trailing effect that you would expect from sort of 80s inspired cyberpunky stuff, so that actually is pretty cool too. And then of course it has a pretty decent soundtrack, which is all synthesizer music that fits in very well with the aesthetic, but unfortunately is not particularly memorable, so it's not the kind of thing you'd be listening to outside of the confines of the game. But once you get past the presentation, you find that the gameplay itself is just mind-numbingly simplistic. All you do is avoid the incoming obstacles, and you do that by switching to one of four lanes. You just go left or right, and that's it. You may think this means that the game is easy, when in reality it's actually not. In fact, it's rather unforgiving as to what you can actually do in the confines of the lanes. A lot of the obstacles are angled at such a way that the timing needs to be absolutely perfect to be able to switch lanes without a actually taking a hit, and you can only take two hits. The first hit will let you keep going, but if you take a second hit, then you have to start over from the last checkpoint, which may well be the beginning of the level. Needless to say, that becomes pretty frustrating pretty quickly, and you very quickly find out that this game wears thin extremely quickly. It's the prime example of aesthetics not being everything, and while they certainly do help this game out quite a bit, when you get into the meat of the game, it just becomes boring and outright irritating very quickly, and as a result, I just can't recommend it. And last, and by every means least, we have I Am Bread, developed by Bossa Studios and released in 2015. The Steam description is, and I quote, you are bread. Your mission, become toast. That's the entire game. You're a loaf of bread, and you're trying to become a piece of toast. To say this game is stupid is an insult to stupidity. I'm not even sure how this ended up in my Steam library. I think it was part of a bundle that I got way back when and just never got around to messing with, and I'm kind of glad I didn't, honestly. You control the piece of bread by grabbing onto one of the corners. Now, it recommends you use a controller, and I can see why. But you grab onto something with the corners of the bread and just kind of launch the piece of bread using the physics engine in order to move around. It's really dumb, it's really awkward, and it doesn't work very well. It's in the same vein as Goat Simulator and Cat Lateral Damage and all that. It's just a really stupid one-off game that is attempting to be silly. And in reality, it just ends up being dumb. And you know, if it were less than five bucks, then I would say, okay, fine, whatever. It's being silly, it's a joke game, some people might be amused by it, whatever. But they want over 10 bucks for it, in fact they want $13 for it, and all you're getting is what you're seeing in the video. Flipping a piece of bread around and knocking things over because ha ha, is it that so funny? This is the kind of game you sit there and stare at and marvel as to how it could even exist. And trying to figure it out simply gives you a migraine. Do not bother with I Am Bread. 
It is really stupid. It is not a good value proposition. And even if you seem to think that this is funny, then it's not going to last very long. Hence me saying, simply do not bother with it. Oh, the joys of shovelware on Steam. Some of it's okay, but some of it, like I Am Bread, just gives you a headache. Thank you all very much for watching. I will catch you all in later videos.